Thank you, Ed. Our, our next speaker is Steve West. Steve is a healthcare attorney with Glenkler Brown in Memphis. He serves as general counsel emeritus for Le Bonner, for Methodist Le Bonner Healthcare. Um, he's had a very decorated career with Methodist. He literally started their legal department in 1979 and ran it as their chief counsel for, the, for over 35 years. He's been very instrumental in the growth of Methodist through hospital acquisitions, through physician practice acquisitions, and also through corporate restructuring. Uh, Methodist has got 2.5 billion in annual revenue and employs over 10,000 people in the Memphis area. Steve is, was very instrumental in bringing the first air ambulance service to, to the region. He's a graduate of the University of Memphis in PR and advertising and also attended University of Memphis Law School. He talked to Steve, you can, you can feel his passion. That's something that Ed and Gary both talked about. That passion was, was recognized by the Memphis Business Journal where he was the only healthcare attorney to receive the Memphis Business Journal's Health Hero Award. Please help me in welcoming Steve. Liz, thanks. Um, Liz asked me to be uh, short and dynamic. And, and I, I told her that I felt certain I could meet the short requirement. <laughs> and, and that I would leave the dynamic up to my good friend, Mike Glenn, the, this, a, this afternoon. So uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, respect the journey. Uh, I looked at the 2012 and I heard all the speakers say it's a journey. And so I reflected on that and I said, well, what do I want to say? I will say respect the journey. Respect and honor yourself first. Respect and honor yourself first. And where do I, do I point that there or just there or there? My first CEO traveled with a, a, a lawyer, me, and, the, and a tech guy, and I'll Ryan, send the banker over. Send the banker over. <laughs> yeah. But, and and I, I always said, Ryan, I'm, I must be doing it wrong. I told you I needed you. It, it, but my first CEO traveled with uh, a lawyer and the tech guy, and I always told him the tech guy was much more valuable than I was. So, uh, oh, that's all right. Two seconds. Sorry. Two two seconds. Um, well, I, I will say, why don't we stand up for a second? I had to get over there. Us old guys had to stand up and stretch. So, why don't you want to stand up and take a take a deep breath? Um, you, you'll see those athletes now do, do those jumps where they, where, where they kick, kick their knees up to themselves. I, I, I can't do that anymore, so, uh, um, but, uh, okay. My, my next slide that you would see, if you want to go ahead and sit back down, we'll, 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 ca we'll catch up because, again, I, I, was, told, I was told to be, uh, to, to try to get through these slides promptly. Um, there we go. Are we rolling? Was be fully present now. Be. There we rolling. We're not rolling. Point it in that direction. Okay. Point it in that direction. Be fully present now. <laughs> All right. But most of you probably don't have the problem that I have of having distractions and too many things on your mind. Uh, but this is something that I highly recommend. I have a little plaque on my desk that says, you know, be here now. Um, point it in that direction. Let's see. There we go. There, there's the paid advertisement. There are some connections. Uh, Wonderlick is at uh, 6,000 Poplar. Uh, I'm, I'm there now. My first uh, hospital transaction was in Biloxi, the Biloxi Regional Medical Center. Uh, spent a lot of time in Lyle Page's office there and uh, uh, working with Jim, with Jim Ziegler. Um, but that's how you can reach me if you need me. Um, point it that direction. Um, University of Memphis, but I will say, um, I have five, we have five degrees from Ole Miss in my family. My wife, Becky Jones West, graduated from here and is on the Women's Council still and is very active here uh, with, with the Women's Council, with the uh, School of Journalism, is a very 
proud about what uh, Dean Norton is doing over there. Uh, my son Ben is 06 undergraduate, uh, 09 law degree, practices in Houston, Texas now with Reed Smith. My daughter's 011, and then my master's in 012 in accounting, and is uh, after doing a, her, her obligatory two year stint with KPMG, is in uh, Memphis with uh, Allenberg Cotton. So we, uh, I jokingly say uh, Ole Miss has uh, most of my money, but uh, that, um, I, I always wanted to come to Ole Miss. Um, was fortunate to get a job. I needed to work when I was in high school at the Park Commission, the athletic department. Um, uh, totally another, another story about my life circumstances, but uh, um, had to make the choice, and, and you, what you've heard is about choices. Had to make the choice and made the choice to stay in Memphis, go to Memphis State, and keep keep my job there working. Um, after two years in private practice uh, with uh, Colton and Blancet, um, again, what you may have heard is an opportunity. A guy I had uh, bought some life insurance from, um, again, because of my family's uh, circumstances, said Methodist is looking to hire their first attorney. Uh, largely had been the first hard med mal insurance market in the mid 70s. They'd gone self-insured and they wanted somebody to come in to do some professional negligence training with the, with the employed staff, which at that time was just primarily nurses and technicians, and, and then also to do some of the major claims. Um, I, I'm a healthcare attorney. Uh, through the years, that lexicon has changed. Uh, we, we were hospital attorneys when it started. Uh, we're, we're, we basically are healthcare attorneys. Um, it's a trillion dollar industry. It gets a lot of attention, a lot of focus. Um, my second week on the job, I toured the operating room with a legendary general surgeon, George Coors, and it took me, it got me. I said, these are special people doing special things and they're really doing it at a time when people are very needy and fragile. And uh, it, it was my motivation to come to work. I may be a little different than these. My father told me when he dropped me off when we started our first job at the Park Commission in the sixth grade, he turned to me and he said, they're paying you to work. So I always heard that every day, that they're paying you to work. So even though he preached an education after becoming a cardiac cripple when he was 36, and, and, and I was seven, my brother was eight. He wanted it to be an education that we applied in work. And so we heard that all the time. So I do say it's work. Um, I, I will have young people call me and say, well, this job's just not fun anymore. And I've, so I quit it. I said, well, do you, where, where's your next job? Well, I don't have a next job. I said, that I, you should have called me earlier. That would not have been the advice I, had, I would, would, have, would have given you. Um, but I'm very involved with academics. I work with the law school in Memphis, what is now called the Institute for Health Law and Policy. Uh, I help, I, I like that. Um, I, I'm, what Emeritus, of course, as you know means, is, is retired. Uh, some of my lawyer friends who, uh, you know, uh, they'll say anything to you means you're has been. But, um, you know, what, for me, I like, I go to Glankler Brown when I want to and I leave when I want to and nobody cares. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good position to be in. But my 35 years, really back to what you have heard, let me see if that'll go back that way, uh, does involve community. Um, Tennesseans for fair and impartial courts, Largely in Tennessee, we don't have general elections for our appellate and Supreme Court justices, and I didn't think we should. So when one of the Supreme Court justices asked me to serve on a statewide committee to continue to try to keep that in place, um, I said, sure. Tennessee Academy of Hospital Attorneys, um, and I'll jump down to the American Health Lawyers, get involved in whatever you, whatever field you are in, with both your state and national organizations. You learn a lot there. Um, 
Memphis Redbirds, I'd much rather talk to you about Ole Miss baseball, but, but and I'll probably be there at five today when Coach Bianco's talking because I have a passion for baseball. Ed, Ed, Ed and I talked about that. Um, I will say the American Health Lawyers is looking at a new health law curriculum in the manual. The short story of that is that the education needs to be more practical. Uh, duh. Well, you know, my favorite professor in law school, oil and gas, he used an oil and gas lease. I promise you if healthcare lawyers were using asset purchase agreements for medical practices and employment agreements, in law school, they'd be much more valuable. That's the essence of, of, of the document, and we hope to help law schools do that by offering people that can actually give practical experience. Um, Memphis and Shelby County Crime Commission, obviously there's been a lot on Memphis and crime uh, just here recently. Um, my faith requires me to mention things that are of hope. Uh, my good friend Ron Wade that runs Hope Works that rehabilitates through education people coming out of incarceration. Um, I'd recommend a book, Tattoos on the Heart, by Greg Boyle. He's the founder of the Homeboy Industries in, in Los Angeles. Uh, I'd, I'd recommend looking at the charter on, on compassion on, on, and, and Google that. Um, I've told you about the University of Memphis, I've told you about the iHelp. Where my heart is on, on the iHelp is the medical legal partnerships. What's a medical legal partnership? Kid comes to Le Bonner with asthma in the emergency room, mother has to take off work, threatens her job. They get them well, goes back home. Kid comes back with another asthma attack a week later and the mother again is getting in a precarious situation, uh, losing her job, bringing her kid to the emergency room. Doctor says, what's going on is outside of happening at Le Bonner in the emergency room must be something at home. Doctor says, medical legal partnership, lawyer from the law school, third year lawyer that can practice law under a mentor of a, of a licensed lawyer. You go find that they're living in a place that is mold, stuff is awful. They need a lawyer to really tell the landlord this has got to be straightened up. That's what a medical legal partnership does. That's where those are the things that interest me now, is where can we bring different disciplines to work together to make a difference? And I will say, I, I encourage you, like Dan Jones running the universe, the people that and I've seen, people that have been doctors who had business degrees or other, they just, they saw the field better. They, they, they knew what was going on and, and they, they could make a difference. So, I loved working with doctors because they didn't think like lawyers. Uh, they didn't always like working with me because they didn't like the way lawyers thought sometimes. <laughs> but uh, my brother's a doctor and some of my best friends are doctors. Um, so that's the healthcare law. I'll pivot now to Methodist. Culture trumps everything. That's who we are. The mission is that we will be in partnership with the medical staff, we'll collaborate with patients and their families to be the leader in providing high quality, cost effective patient and family centered care. Services will be provided in a manner which supports the health ministries and the social principles of the United Methodist Church to benefit the communities we serve. Key words there for me are partnership and collaboration. We can't do it alone. Healthcare is extremely complicated. I just gave you the example of the medical legal partnerships. Um, so partnerships and collaborative. The Methodist way is similar to what when you hear people talk about the Ole Miss family. That the Methodist way, that our culture trumps everything. The vision, again, Methodist is faith-based healthcare system in partnership with its physicians. Will be nationally recognized for delivering outstanding care to each patient, achieved through collaboration with patients and families. Our values, service, quality, integrity, teamwork, innovations. Um, to me, I would encourage you teamwork. If you can't work in a team in today's world, that's where I see the difference. I support a school called uh, Memphis Catholic High that has a program called Education That Works where the kids basically work to pay their tuition to go to that school. And 
when I go to the boot camp where we give them orientation to where they're valuable to the employees, we put them in teams to do the assignments, and it's remarkable. It is remarkable to see those young people um, work together in teams. Um, that's different than what, how I came out. It was very competitive, and it was, you know, you were competing. Um, I, from my viewpoint, that's one of the good things about what the world's changed. Um, we are part of the United Methodist Church. Mississippi farmer John Sheard largely raised the money. His pastor was in the hospital in Memphis in another hospital in a charity ward. He said, I don't like that. I've spent several years riding around to folks, talking to them about getting the Methodist Hospital started. Um, said, I don't want to have charity wards. Um, again, that's been, again, to me, one of the things that I, I've, I've always enjoyed. Um, currently, there are eight hospitals in West Tennessee, six in Memphis, one in Fayette County, and our newest in Olive Branch, which we're very proud to be, be there. It's a, a, a wonderful hospital. Uh, Le Bonner is one mile from St. Jude. Uh, that partnership is very close. It's not one that most people know. St. Jude has 50 beds. It's a small inpatient hospital. It's primarily a research. Most of the St. Jude patients that have surgery have it at Le Bonner. Most of the St. Jude patients that have any interventional work have it at Le Bonner. Um, their, their CEO sits on our board. It's a, it's a wonderful relationship. It's a, it's a wonderful place. Um, our 30-bed residential hospice, again, it's special to me because of what I alluded to about end of life. It's really increased the focus on end of life. We've had patients as young as several weeks old. We've had patients 100, 100 years old. What happens there is uh, truly, uh, for me, uh, remarkable. Um, it's healthcare, I think, at its best to where people come together and really listen to the patient, try to listen to the family, uh, alleviate pain, and it's, uh, uh, it, it's really special. Um, affiliated companies, we've got everything from surgery centers to home care. We've got our joint ventures of rehab. And show you just a few of the pictures real quick. Um, some statistics real quick. We're now up to 12,000 associates. I will just stop right there. Culture means everything. We spend a lot more time trying to determine if new hires will be a good fit with our culture. Sometimes that's frustrating for people. They'll call me, I can't get through. I'm kind of going, stay in there. Be diligent. Complete the online process. Complete those pre-screening things. I can help you then get face-to-face -face with some decision makers. But companies aren't doing these things because they're not important. They're not spending money now because they're not important. Sometimes they don't work right. Don't get me, it's kind of, it reminds me of some of the things that I read about getting parking passes at Ole Miss. But, I mean, things don't always work right in big organizations, but there's a reason they're there. So don't let them frustrate you, even though they may, because you are the one who's looking for the job. So hang in there. 2,000 physicians, as I said, the world's changed. We've got a lot more physicians that have, are employed now. We operate uh, that number of beds, 1,279, 61,000 discharges, 262,000 outpatient visits, ER visits, 261, uh, births or deliveries, almost 5,000, surgeries, 35,000, solid organ transplants, 250, top 10. Of course, most of you have heard about Steve Jobs having his uh, there in Memphis, uh, tremendous, fascinating stories there. Uh, again, pretty in, in, incredible about how all that happened. And uh, my brother was MD. He's the medical director for the anesthesia service for the transplant program. And I said, well, what did he talk to you about? And he said, um, he wanted to talk about when I sold computers for IBM. So uh, he was uh, he was very focused and passionate uh, he, he, even when uh, he, he was there. Um, total assets, 1.8 billion. Um, total operating revenues, 1.4. Cash and investments, 0.6 billion. Long-term debt, 
uh, half a billion, A, a plus bond rating from Moody's and S&P. I just give you that because again, that's a board decision to be an A rated. Does it impact a lot of things? Yes, it does. It means we're not trying to be triple A. It means we're not trying to be double A. We've decided though we need to be A. It means we're not gonna be less than that. We're not gonna be a B. Uh, that, so that brings finances in. I think that's being a good steward. It's being just like you would hopefully run your business or run your family. You, you, you've got to, as they say, you've got to do well to do good. So um, our, our back to our collaborations and partnerships. Um, University of Tennessee, I love academic medicine. I love, I, I think that the evidence is out, out there that the best medicine in this country is in academics. Um, we've got a lot more doctors. Um, love the new relationships with the oncology group, West Cancer. Uh, Dr. Kurt Tower is just well, a special guy doing special things without a doubt. Um, Sutherland Cardiology, our CV surgeons. It's, again, it's a new world to have CV surgeons that are working for the hospital. Uh, primary care, that's a sea change. I mean, the, it is absolutely a sea change. I mean, I dealt with buying physicians' practices in the mid-90s as a result of the for-profits, FICOR. This is totally different. This is a true fundamental change. Um, doctors wanting to needing to be part of the larger organizations. Um, Medical Education and Research Institute, it's fascinating uh, frozen cadavers are donated body parts uh, doctors are learning uh, that you can learn so much more on an actual body uh, it's it's incredible place there in memphis my good friend dr john duckworth again a business-minded md came up with that idea and we put it together with duckworth pathology group and the sims murphy uh, neurological group uh, back in the mid 90s uh, just we're really doing some great stuff. Gamma Knife uh, Health, Gamma Knife's incredible what they do. Um, hospital Wing, you heard uh, Liz mention that. Um, one thing's not on there is the, the MED, which is now Regional One and the Trauma Center. Um, I was uh, blessed in the 80s to have the opportunity to, or the challenge, which uh, as my son reminded me, he said, Dan, aren't, aren't they both the one and the same? I said, That's, you, 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 you've listened. Uh, he, I, I said, uh, they said, we're gonna get a chance to run what was then the city of Memphis hospital. We wanna get them outside of government. We wanna take them private. Um, can you set up a separate company and get that done? We wanna have less union influence, less government influence, less restrictions on purchasing. Um, so we um, ran the med for about five years then, but that's when the Elvis Presley Trauma Center was created. Uh, we're, we're proud of that. We support them. That's when the Burn Center was created. Uh, it's, it's a great service for the community. Uh, Methodist is, a, a, again, ranked number one. Nine specialties. Again, those rankings are important. Um, Le Bonner's, my favorite transaction, 1995. Uh, earlier, I'd been asked by one of my C of my five CEOs at the CEO at the time said, you know, can you do a white paper to see if Labonner would be a good culture fit with us? And so I did and concluded they'd be a great culture fit. So it broke my heart when they started negotiating with Baptist, and then it did my heart great when the Baptist deal didn't didn't happen and they started negotiating with us. Uh, they were represented by. McDermott, Will, and Emory out of Chicago. Um, big city lawyers do what big city lawyers do. There was an issue every day. Um, I, I, back to my story that it's work, but I, it was also you know a challenge and an opportunity, and, and, and I enjoyed it. It's my favorite transaction. Interesting side story, though, about the new Le Bonner, which is there in 2010. Um, Gary Shore had a great vision. He said, I, I want that new Le Bonner right here near, stay near St. Jude. I would like it be right next to the new campus. Uh, the only thing that's right there that's available is the Memphis Mental Health Hospital that's owned by both the city and the county. Um, uh, how, how can we make that happen? 
He said, plus, you know, the old Bold Hospital is the location where the new mental health hospital ought to be right next to the meds emergency room. That's really where adult mental health ought to be. Our, our people that come in, in in the emergency area and our police say that would make everything so much better for the patients if we had something near near the emergency room. So we started working. Well, we started renovating space at Methodist University for a transplant. We took over the old bold building that was full of mold and deteriorating. Um, we got a new transplant. We basically told the city and the county uh, and the state, we want to buy the mental health hospital. We're going to give you our money before we close so that you can take our money and build the new mental health hospital. They said, duh. Uh, but once we sat and explained how it was going to going to work, and said this this will work, uh, but I didn't want to. I said we don't want to have the risk of owning a mental health hospital, so we did some our lawyer transactions and and got it done. And and that so that's one of my stories of how when a CEO has a vision, it reminds me of my first CEO. He looked at me, and said, I want a one-handed lawyer. I was a young kid, what do you mean you want to, he said, man, when I ask you a question, I don't want to hear, but on the other hand. So, you know, what, what, what I love is when young people come by my office at the end of the day and say, can I ask you this question about this, this observation, that they didn't leave before they, the most, the ones that I look back and say, wow, it doesn't surprise me that they're a senior vice president in the Washington, D.C. at a company. They stopped by my office and said, can I ask you a question about this before I go home? Is there anything else I can do? That's, that, that's an observation that I'd make. Uh, market share, um, all that, we don't need to spend much time on that. I better follow Ryan's advice, though. Um, this is important. Um, philanthropy to e equals excellence. That's back to partnerships and collaborations. You see that certainly here at Ole Miss, but it's certainly true in, in healthcare. Philanthropy equals excellence. Uh, the Labonner transaction was a $350 million, but 100 of that came from the community. Hospice residents wouldn't have happened. It was a, that, that doesn't make sense financially, but the community came and supported. FedEx Family House, again, it's such a privilege to be here with Mike Glenn FedEx. They're such a wonderful community partner of ours. That FedEx house, not only did the money come from there, their employees continue to basically staff that and do special events at the FedEx house, which is next to Le Bonner. So many of those families um, don't have places to stay, so the FedEx house is just fabulous. It's very inspiring, but it's also inspiring that the FedEx employees want to do that. Um, the Center for Faith and Health, I'll talk about that. Sickle cell, another. Sickle cell is a chronic disease. African-American primarily, tremendous pain, focuses, um, it, it, it's just was not something that was being handled right. And, and so the decision was made to do it. Um, and, and again, it's been very rewarding because it really can have that impact, similar to what I told you about the medical legal partnership to change lives. Um, we're the largest 10 care provider, which in Tennessee is, is Medicaid, charity care, community benefits, serving all the community and commitment to academic medicine. Um, briefly about the Congregational Health Network, kind of an interesting thing that we have is we partner with our churches. Uh, the observation was that churches are places where people do slow down and do feel a level of trust. Um, so some of the things that we weren't doing very well in the hospital setting um, happened better in churches. Um, it allowed us to do some education. The slide that I really want to get to is that one. You have these congregations. They select these liaisons, people from their congregation, to actually train and, and be connected to what we call navigators to help navigate people through healthcare. 
if you've had a family member or yourself been involved with health care, you know how, how it can be very disjointed in navigators. And, and then they work with, with our director. Um, it, it, that's a busy slide, but we've got 580. Uh, they don't all do the, the, want all the same thing. 232 congregations want care for the dying. 280 were also involved with mental health and first aid. 121 in aftercare, in other words, helping their people know what needs to be done when they go home, what medicines they need, what services they need. Uh, and then transplant, which is an important area, and, and pastoral care. Um, it's really making a difference. 40% of all our charity care is in the blue, and so are those congregations. Um, they're primarily, uh, again, um, African-American, <laughs> smaller, non-denominational. Um, what you see is uh, on Thursday nights when we do that training at Methodist University Hospital and it's broadcast in, in other areas, really what I call the the, the power of the African American woman. Um, it, it manifests itself frequently. They're not all women, but they're to a large extent are, and, and it's 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 real and it's true, and we've we've embraced it. Um, the leadership journey. Let's try to keep moving along. I've talked about those and the value of teamwork. Um, the jaws of culture. Um, passive aggressive, stalled communications, silos, judgmental, lack of openness and trust, coaching, teamwork, accountability. Um, I think that slide, you, you folks that are in the MBA program, you probably have, have seen something similar. We believe it and we teach it and we train it and we follow it. What, what does that culture mean? We're, we're looking for that slide doesn't show very good, but it says we're looking for accountability, coaching, collaboration, trust, real open dialogue, embracing change. That's where we see high performance. Where are you leading? You're leading yourself first. Honest, respect yourself first. You're leading your team and you're doing organizational leadership. Energy. Ener we recognize energy is important. You, wh what has that done? Our leaders are much more conscious on their personal health, diet, exercise, consumption of alcohol, all those issues that had largely companies said, well, you know, that's your personal stuff. We said, bunk, it relates to how, how you perform. Um, so reading good books, good books make a difference. Um, so we spend a lot of time on that. We call it the mood elevator. How we feel when we're at our best and when we're not. We try to stay at curious. When meetings start getting frustrating, we say, let's get the elevator back to curious. Curious not being judgmental. Curious without assumptions. Curious without assumptions. But the mood elevator is a very important thing for our organization. Um, back to moods, our state of minds, we, we again, we, we think that that's an important thing and, and so we, 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 we teach it and we train, we train it. Uh, that slide didn't do much. Well, I don't know if I'm come back. Again, power of thought. Our thinking drives our behaviors, our thoughts determine our moods and our moment-to-moment -moment experience. I think they, I don't think you'd argue with that. Um, the human operating system. Um, the ones that I see are the people who can be curious but can remain patient and kind. Um, in healthcare, that's, those are important, important traits. Our accountability ladder, get on with it. You heard that, find solutions, own it, acknowledge reality, and then you see the powerless. Not every solution is the solution, but it may be a solution and it may be a signal that you're doing the right thing. Um, this says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. 
That author was the serenity prayer. We sort of changed it to say this. God grant me the serenity to accept the people I cannot change, the courage to change the person I can, and the wisdom to know it is me. Katrina blew, Katrina blew my best, one of, probably is my best friend to Memphis, Danny Abramowitz. Danny was a, a leading receiver for the New Orleans Saints in 1969, led the NFL. Uh, Marcus Colston broke all his records. He then coached with uh, Mike Ditka in, in New Orleans and Chicago. Um, but Danny also was an alcoholic and is a recovering alcoholic, uh, but came to Katrina, became my neighbor. He said, Steve, the only person you can lead is yourself. Then people may see things in you that they want to follow. So work on leading yourself. Um, community is important, but community is caring for people. It's not imposing our ideals on community and saying this is the community that it has to be. Um, that slide sort of says it all about Le Bonner. I love it. But let me zip through these. It is a journey. Respect the journey. Enjoy the people. Um, everybody knows Robert. I love him. Have you heard Dan allude to him? But Rose Jackson Flanora went to Ole Miss here with my wife. Um, Richard and Lily and Rose, to me, they live and reflect everything that is good about Ole Miss. And those are the people you want to seek mentors. You want mentors, but seek mentors that you want to be around and you should be around. Have a to-do list, but don't forget your to-be list. And, and look at that to-be list because I know I've been guilty of looking at my to-do list many days more than my to-be list. And those were probably not my, some of my better days. Um, the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. And again, do the things you need to get done to be that person you've decided you want to be. This is an important slide. It's like being fully present. What is intended for me in these circumstances? Every day, good and bad happens. And reflect and ponder on what is intended for you out of these circumstances. Find you a spot where you can do that. Um, I, I think that reflection for me has become very important. Um, there are times when silence has the loudest voice. I need to find spots where I can be silent. I need to go on retreats. I need to get away. Who begins too much accomplishes little. It is never too late to be what you might have been. So if you're not there now, it ain't to start today. It's never too late. Um, CVS just decided to stop selling tobacco. How long have we known tobacco was not healthy? So it's never too late to be who you want to be. The good news of that story as you read it is that their stock prices have continued to climb. Uh, now they feared to cut it off because of the dollars, but they did it. And I'm just telling you, it's never too late to be who you want to be. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Um, Morris West said, when you get to my age, probably the only word you need to remember is thanks. Another author that I read, Ron Rollheiser, said you need to remember forgiveness. Uh, I say give. And give of your time. Give of your talents. Give of your treasures to things that are important to you, to things that you have decided make you a, a better person. All right. Let's see if I can get that. But remember to laugh. In addition, I, I, I'm guilty of being too serious. I promise to be short, and this sli slide will confirm that I am short. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm done. <laughs>